In 2012, five MBA students began developing an idea to address food insecurity in the world's urban slums. But it might seem a little unconventional to you. It's insect farming. But guess what? Not only did their idea win the world's most prestigious social enterprise competition, they beat out 10,000 other competitors and were presented the $1 million Holt Prize by former U.S. President Bill Clinton. Now, since winning the award, two of those students, Mohamed Ashour and Gabe Mott, have launched Aspire Food Group. It's a social enterprise focused on farming edible insects. It has operations in Mexico, Ghana, and the U.S. Take a look. This type of farming can be done anywhere in Ghana. And especially the rural folks, they need this farming to supplement their income and then to have protein in their diet. It is an alternative way of giving people continuous livelihood and also raising their standard of living because they are making money. Now, compared to livestock, insects require far less resources to convert the same amount of protein. Less farmland, less water, and emit far fewer greenhouse gases. Joining us now to share their vision of providing economically challenged and malnourished populations with high-protein, sustainable food solutions are Mohamed Ashour and Gabe Mott. Guys, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's exciting to be here. Thanks, and May. so fascinating what you guys are up to. Um, Mohamed, it's not every day you mm -hmm. hear about insect farming, mm -hmm. right? So why did you guys even decide to do this? What, what, where did this idea even come from? Yeah, so actually, I mean, um, so we were all in the MBA program at McGill University, and in maybe the first two months of the program, a friend reached out to me on LinkedIn okay. saying, uh, Mohammed, I know you're into these kind of things. Check this thing out called the Halt Prize. And I went on the website and saw that this was an interesting call to action that Bill Clinton, in conjunction with the Halt International Business School, put out to teams from around the world. Right. And every year, there's a different challenge. And that year, 2008, 13, the challenge is food insecurity in urban slums. How do you come up with a business that is for profit, yes. which at its very core and that's solves, important. it's important, yeah. and, and that's that's to avoid the sort of one life cycle of charity right. to create that perpetual sustainability, and that was very attractive from both a business perspective and also um, for most of, most of our backgrounds. But here's where I'm curious: so why insect farming? Uh, because again, you know, in certain parts of the world, it's not a big deal. Right, um, consuming insects, but but to you here, you're living in the states and you're going to school. Insect farming, wow, Gabe. I mean, <laughs> you know, did that sure. seem foreign to you at the time when you were tackling this? Yes, it, <laughs> yes. actually, I, I'll be fully honest. Uh, Mohammed actually, I mean, not only did he he form the team and, and originally hear about the Hall Prize, we spent. I guess three months, two, three months trying to sort out the different options and different solutions. We came up with a lot of good ideas, yeah. but we were low on spectacular ideas. And okay. we knew the caliber of the competition <laughs> that was going to be there. We knew it just had to be an extraordinary idea. And then, Mohammed, I think you were talking to a friend of yours who was a physician. Right. And, uh, and he had had a patient recently who had complained about stomach issues. And when he was doing his examination, she told him that he, she had eaten insects. So the, the doctor assumed that it was the insects that had caused the illness. And the patient's like, obviously not. I've been eating them my entire life. Oh, wow. And so uh, Mohammed's friend mentioned this to Mohammed. Mohammed brought it back to the team. And, and after a little consideration, we recognized that this was an idea that, that we could something. really run with. Yeah. Wow. Right. And, and to add to that, I mean, we know that 80% of the world's countries have a history of eating insects. Yeah. That's, that's the vast majority of the world. So in fact, while it's certainly not conventional that insects are consumed in the United States or in Canada or some parts of Europe, that's actually the exception and not the rule. Right. Uh, and of course, every country has a different history and a culture behind specific insects. So if you go to Mexico, for example, in the southern state of Oaxaca, people are, are, have a very strong and sort of cherished interest in eating grasshoppers, but that doesn't translate to every other insect. So, so people might say, look, I love eating grasshoppers, but you know, silkworms, that's, that's strange. Yeah, that's and in a different so country, right. it's Exactly, different. exactly. But let's talk about the fact that insects, like you said, 80% of the world, mm -hmm. you know, actually consumes them. And the protein, the nutritional value of insects is pretty extraordinary. I said briefly in that intro that mm -hmm. it's equivalent to other conventional animal proteins. So tell me a little bit about the nutritional benefits of insects. Absolutely. So we, we obviously, because we all grew up in, in, in a part of the world where insect consumption isn't a prevalent thing, right. we wanted to understand what's the appeal here? Why do people enjoy eating insects? And the taste was up there, but then we noticed that the nutrition was extraordinary. If you mm -hmm. look at 100 grams of cricket, 
protein, for example, and you compare it to 100 grams of beef, both dry weight, crickets have almost 70% protein by weight, um, w which is extraordinary wow. when you compare it to many other conventional forms. And we're talking about in an in a almost unprocessed form. Huh. Um, and not only is the protein content high, which is impressive, the iron content is impressive as well, mm -hmm. uh, and much higher than you would find in, in other conventional forms of livestock. Right. Like six times that of beef. Yep. Six times? Six times, which actually it makes, there are a lot of different situations where you can see different insects being really therapeutic foods, right? They can actually be used to address, we suspect at least, that they can be used to address medical issues. Really? So for example, mm -hmm. in, uh, in southern Mexico, there are major issues with anemia in the rural populations. Mm -hmm. uh, they eat some grasshoppers, but grasshoppers are, are obviously incredibly expensive, right? I mean... Oh, are they? I, yeah, didn't, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, if anywhere you go, anywhere we've been in the world, okay. wherever you find insects in a market, they cost more than beef or chicken. Mm -hmm. So insects no are... No kidding. They are, without exception, a premium food. Everywhere. Wow. And the question is, why is that? Yeah, well, exactly, if, if why? They're, if they're so resource efficient, et cetera, et cetera, it makes very little sense. Well, the reason is because insects are seasonal. So oh. they're only available for a few months out of the year. Okay. And when they are available, you have to hand harvest them. I see. You know, so managing a cow is significantly easier Easy. than catching a thousand grasshoppers Didn't on a field. Didn't think about it that way because you think, I mean, we'll get into this because obviously that's why you want insect farms because you mm -hmm. can grow them around year round. Absolutely. Right? right. So I know that you're getting into that or you've already started that concept, right, sure. of, mm -hmm. of insect farming. Tell me a, a little bit about where you're doing it and how you're doing it. Yep. Dave? Sure. Yeah. So we have, uh, we have an insect farm in, uh, in Ghana in West Africa and in Austin, Texas, because when you think Austin, insect farming, you think Austin, Texas, right? Uh, uh, I, yes, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> well, Austin has this motto, keep Austin weird, so we're trying to fit oh, right in. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and so how, how is that going? And is it, I mean, what are the challenges in actually farming insects? I mean, there are a lot of challenges, but it's, yeah, it's an exciting process. So uh, if you think about uh, conventional livestock farming, it's been done for hundreds to thousands of years, depending on how you want to count it. And on an, uh, uh, in, on an institutional level, people have been doing industrialized livestock farming for, for quite a while. Sure. And so they've iterated, they've, they've developed a lot of techniques, and they've become very, very efficient. Now, nobody's put the time and effort in to do this with insects yet. And as we start to do this, we recognize that, yeah, if you bring commercial processes to insect farming, you can improve the scale and you can get yields that are far superior. And to obviously that of any bring the cost livestock. down too. Well, of course. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And let's not forget the environmental benefits of uh, consuming insects and growing insects because it's not it doesn't have the greenhouse gas emissions, it doesn't use as much water, everything right. that I talked about, again, in the intro. Um, so how can that make an impact as well if the world con starts consuming more insects? Absolutely, and actually that's precisely why we ended up setting up a facility in Austin, Texas. Remember, we started off focusing on emerging markets, developing countries where issues like iron, and, iron deficiency, anemia, protein, right. energy, malnutrition are prevalent. But then you realize that California has a drought. You realize that yes, Austin and, yeah. and the state of Texas is That's also right. in a perpetual, very difficult water shortage problem. Yep. And that, I'm not going to say is entirely, but certainly largely due to heavy water consumption in a lot of the livestock industry applications. And the feed. And the feed, they, they absolutely. Yep. And so from our perspective, this is an objectively superior source of food, not just from its nutritional footprint and what can it do for the human body. We know all sorts of research now about red meat and how you should moderate your consumption of it because yep. of other various sort of health consequences from over-consuming red meat. Uh, but there's the environmental component. Now you're looking at the footprint of your food. Yeah. How much water resources has, has it consumed? How much energy? How much land? Uh, and what are the emissions looking like? Right. And that's where insect farming becomes extremely attractive. Well, I was just going to say, you brought some samples and you mentioned the powder. Tell me about what that is and the advantages of, of using that kind of powder. It's a cricket-based powder? Okay. Yeah, it's, it's not even cricket-based. It's just cricket, It's period. just fully cricket. Just cricket. Okay. Just yeah. cricket. Right. Yeah, okay. so you just roast them up, grind them, and you get this high-protein, high-nutrient, high-iron powder that you can use as a supplement in your in your cooking and your foods uh, and just put it into anything you want to cook with it. You want to put it into something sweet you can. If you want to do uh, a high protein, high iron pasta, you can do that too. 
And you don't have the actual cricket like staring at you while you're eating right. it. Right, yeah. and and I think I think the other component here as well is education. Yeah. Uh, I think right. I think it's important for us to recognize that with any novel food entering into a market, there has to be some patience in terms of there being a, a synergy between market readiness and consumer readiness. Yeah. Um, and and for us, we take a you know we take a lesson from the chapter of sushi or other kinds of foods that you know in the past, not the very distant past, were unconceivable That's mainstream true. sources of protein or food. And today, of course, are so con conventional that nobody right. thinks twice about their origin or or how they even penetrated the mainstream. Uh, and so, from our perspective, there there is both working in, t in tandem with the consumer, understanding what is it that consumers really care about for cricket protein. At this point, for example, we've done tons of consumer surveys throughout you know North America, okay. and in particular Canada and the United States. And we're finding that a lot of people are interested in the function of the protein. There's a ton of functional eaters out there. People mm. who it doesn't they look at food food really as fuel, as fuel yeah. and, and it depends and, and if they can get a higher performance out of that food it doesn't matter what it is they're gonna eat it mm. then you have people who are very focused on you know taste and then you start working with chefs to create culinary you know um, inventions and, and different ways that you can use this as an ingredient in, in appetizing you know um, dishes right and then there's people who really care about the social impact uh, and and what's particularly interesting and Gabe can probably comment about this even more because he's a vegetarian is we're even finding certain uh, uh, communities, even within the vegetarian community, people who actually find this to be an interesting protein alternative. Okay. Because it, it doesn't, it, 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 while it may be considered an animal protein, it doesn't carry the ethical and sort of ecological concerns that a lot of uh, vegetarians you know, who have, who have those kinds yeah, of concerns. Conventional animals. Absolutely. Proteins, yeah. so, so, so understanding the consumer and what the consumer desires and understanding that this is a product that is new to the market, that there is some education required, is also crucial in order to really make sure that it's not a gimmick, but that it is something that is seen as a food source. And with a planet that is growing as rapidly as ours is, right. that is urbanizing rapidly, that is seeing a shortage of, you know, arable land, and that is going to have nearly 9 billion people, we're not going to be able to continue to feed the whole world using beef and using chicken. We're going to need new alternatives. So in some sense, people have to gracefully embrace this yeah. uh, as, as, as just a part of, of the world. No, I like that comparison to sushi because it's true. Mm -hmm. that, that stigma uh, that originally was there, I mean, it's non-existent. So mm -hmm. you do see a future where people aren't even going to give Absolutely. it a second thought. Absolutely. Right? Um, what kind of impact do you hope? that Aspire Foods is going to have because this is obviously a project that started by just with this competition but now you definitely see that there there's some legs here <laughs> well, okay. I, I didn't mean that. Well, okay. I said it's it. It's okay. You have, <laughs> we're, we're not bugged by it. It's fine. <laughs> okay, getting back on topic. But, think, yeah, there's, there's a future. Yeah, there is a future. And I think the, the impact we're looking at differs depending on the country that we're looking at, right? Yeah. So I think in Ghana, we're seeing a huge uptake in the community where people love the insects. We grow palm weevils in Ghana. People love palm weevils. They're Tell delicious. Tell me what those are. I, I, uh, I so was reading about that, and I was like, what are these? Sure. Uh, palm weevil is a, a beetle. It's actually a pest that uh, causes oh. damage in palm plantations. Okay. Um, but people eat the larval stage, and they look like they look like maggots the size of your thumb. But, Yummy. But I, right. Okay. So yeah. it's, I mean, that's, that, that's a hard ick factor to get by. Right. Um, but they were one of the first insects I ever ate, and it was a struggle for me, especially having been vegetarian for so many years. Okay. But they're delicious. Really? They really, they're like, I, I think they're in my top three. Does it taste like chicken? Yeah. No, no. <laughs> no. It, it's sort of got a calamari texture, but they're, they're Swedish. They're like, they're really quite nice. Really? Yeah. Okay. Well, I really okay. like them. And that's a, a, a good protein source that uh, is reliable and... Absolutely, and, and, and I think from an impact perspective, I mean, you know, we talk about us living in a world now where people are so informed, people are so, um, you know, last year one of the top ten tr trends in food is millennials, 90% of millennials polled now read labels on the back of their products. Mm. Um, and, and we live in, in a world where people really care about the why behind, behind the company and, and our DNA, sort of the why behind Aspire, is we refuse to live in a world where food and nutrition insecurity abound. And we have the audacity, the skills, the passion, ingenuity, 
rebelliousness and commitment to excellence to do something about it. Right. Um, in fact, those words spell out aspire. Uh, oh, and, nice! Uh, and, I love that. Yeah, and, uh, and 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 one of the things we envision is is really avoiding the the charity model in the sense of we want to you know produce this food and just feed people. That's great. That's a phenomenal first step. But yeah. even better than that is empowering those communities to right. produce their own food. That's so right. how do we take this technology, how do we simplify it and then deconstruct it and then package it and then provide it to individual farmers in rural Ghana, which we've already done, mm -hmm. and enable them with very minimal training, even if they're completely literate, to actually start producing the source of food for their own sustenance. Right, and, and we're be finding, the supplier. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and, and we're right. finding a ripple effect that's beautiful in terms of impact we never envisioned. So mm -hmm. another example, the va one of the biggest problems in slums, in, in parts of the world where people are earning a couple of dollars a day, is that you have this crowding, you have seven people living in less than 100 square feet. Mm -hmm. And the worst part is, it's one thing to be retired in you know, a developed you know, nation or civilization where you, you kind of feel useless, you kind of feel that your contribution to society is limited. It's entirely a new level of devastation when you're a senior and an elder living in a home where you really are an extra mouth to feed right. and you're doing very little to attach your family. So what's, th what's really cool is that in Ghana, more than 50% of our farmers are actually above the age of 65. <gasps> wow. And so not only is this giving them something to do in their free time because it's very uh, 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 easy to do, it's not manual labor intensive whatsoever. Okay. Now they are actually directly feeding the family and sort of recapturing that role as the elder in the family who's really providing in a significant and direct way. Okay, we need to try some of the stuff that you brought in. Absolutely. So, um, so here are the crickets, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm just going to pick one up so you know we can just take a look. So it's a pretty small little cricket. Yep. And how is this prepared? Uh, so, so that cricket is just a straight roasted cricket. So, roasted. Okay. Uh, so yeah. So if you look in in Mexico, say, where grasshoppers are part of the, the culinary traditions. They'll roast them with lime and garlic, mm -hmm. uh, or they'll roast them with chilies, and they're, they're nicely flavored. These, we, we sell to people to add to their cooking as they wish, so these come unflavored. These so are just straight this is, this is roasted, just a roasted cricket, cricket. Right. Yeah. Yeah, see, I've had cricket before. I actually really like them mm -hmm. because they're very crunchy. They are. Yeah. And, and it's a great garnish that you can add mm. to a salad. You can mm -hmm. actually, you know, uh, in fact, in Mexico, um, usually outside of soccer stadiums in the state of Oaxaca, it, this is a popcorn Oh my God! Yeah, that people literally will just pop back and think about it. The exactly. protein content is no, excellent. No, totally. You're getting the benefits of the protein, Absolutely. so it's like a bag of nuts or something. Yeah, for now, sure. this the chocolate that you brought has the powder in it, right? Right. So, <clears throat> Mohammed, can you pass me that plate so I Absolutely. can try that? Yes. Chocolate, anything, I'll eat it. I and mean, this, chocolate covered rocks, I would eat. So. And, and, yeah, and this is actually yeah. made by one of the what, what is considered one of the top ten chocolatiers in in, in the United States based mm. in Austin, Delicia, and they focus on really ultra-premium gourmet chocolates that oh, are handmade. Delicious. It's, it's yeah, really quite good. something. And that's actually using the cricket flour. So take that and then grind it into a very fine flour that can then be used as an as a ingredient in any product. So, so this is a, a really healthy chocolate that's bar. That's a superfood chocolate. And That's it awesome, <laughs> and it doesn't and it doesn't have so 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 now you're having chocolate without the guilt and without that chalky protein bar kind of you know texture that makes you very unhappy with. Honestly, it. it's delicious, and I'm not just saying that. It is like a really good quality chocolate. I mean, I don't taste the powder, but I right. guess that's meant to be that way, right? You right, don't really right. taste it. Right. So this, okay, so a bar of this chocolate would be the equivalent of what in terms of protein content? So depending think? on the size, uh, it could have anywhere up to 10 to 15 grams of, of protein. Wow. Um, so you're talking about a bar that's competitive with protein bars that are out there, yeah. but at the same time has the, 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 the taste and, and deliciousness of being chocolate. And what's interesting is, I mean, obviously here on the table you have two products that I would say this represents the gateway product yes. to, to a current consumer today. This is something you will see five years from now when you walk into a restaurant, a sort of a, an appetizer salad that is offered before people consume. So in some sense, this, you know, it, it's, we certainly don't expect, although it would be delightful to see consumers rushing to purchase, you know, whole roasted crickets so they can consume them right away. But once you try it in flour form and once you sort of 
accept the ingredient, right. it doesn't matter in which form yeah, you consume yeah. it from that Slowly point but surely, onwards. people Absolutely. adapt to it. So, so cool. Thank you. Thank you both for being here. It was fascinating learning about your idea and your business, and good luck to both of you. Thank you so Inspire much. Foods. It's amazing. Thank you so much. All right. Well, coming up next, a look at food options beyond meat. We'll be right back.